actually just have a few slides to go ahead and finish up this PowerPoint on adrenergic agonists part two. Okay, so we are talking about direct acting adrenergic agonists. Um, these are drugs that bind directly to adrenergic receptors like alpha receptors or beta receptors and they stimulate them. They activate the receptor just like epinephrine or norepinephrine would. Marabegron is a beta-3 agonist, um, so it's relatively specific for beta-3 receptors. We usually talk about beta-1 receptors and beta-2 receptors. We don't really mention beta-3 receptors as much, but beta-3 receptors happen to be highly concentrated in the um, bladder. So um, when Mirabegron stimulates these beta-3 agonists, it causes relaxation of the detrusor muscle of the bladder. Um, and this increases the bladder capacity. We've seen uh, stimulating beta receptors cause muscle relaxation before. We remember the beta-2 receptors that are present in the bronchioles. When they're stimulated, they cause smooth muscle relaxation that opens up the bronchioles. In this case, it's beta-3 receptors in the bladder, but when they're stimulated, they cause a relaxation of the detrusor muscle. Um, when the detrusor muscle relaxes, the bladder is um, able to expand more and we have um, less of an urge to urinate frequently. So this Mirabegron is used for overactive bladder. Um, it allows patients to go longer in between releasing urine, so they have less of a less frequent urges to release urine, and they can release larger amounts at a time. Um, some adverse drug effects: we do see an increase in blood pressure with Mirabegron. Um, Mirabegron is selective for beta three receptors, but when we say that a drug is selective, it's not always perfect. So there can be some stimulation of beta-1 receptors that could increase blood pressure. So um, this should not be given in patients with uncontrolled hypertension. If the patient has hypertension and it's controlled, you've got them on meds and it's at a controlled level, you're at goal and you're fine, then you can prescribe this. Um, but I would keep a close eye on the hypertension because you might need to adjust meds um, once this is added on board. So just keep a close eye on it. But if the hypertension is uncontrolled, you haven't been able to get it under control yet, then you should not start this med yet. Um, <clears throat> there are some drug interactions that are important with Mirabegron. Um, one, it results in increased levels of digoxin. Um, the thing with digoxin that makes us concerning is that digoxin is a narrow therapeutic index drug, meaning there's not a very big difference between its um, therapeutic concentration and its toxic concentration. So um, the doses that we would use therapeutically are very close to toxic doses. So any small change in the concentration of digoxin can result in toxicity. Um, <clears throat> when Mirabegron is started in a patient who's already on digoxin, there are increased levels of digoxin in that patient. So that's something that needs to be very, very closely watched. Um, if you have a patient on digoxin and you're gonna start Mirabegron, you need to get digoxin levels and monitor the level of the digoxin to make sure that you don't need to decrease the dose of the digoxin. Um, Mirabegron inhibits CYP2D6. Um, CYP2D6 is a enzyme that metabolizes a lot of different drugs. Um, it metabolizes metoprolol, um, which is a beta blocker that we use for blood pressure or heart failure. Um, it also metabolizes a lot of pain medications, like opioid pain medications. Um, CYP2D6 metabolizes a lot of antipsychotic drugs. So the point here is if you have a patient on one of these drugs that's metabolized by CYP2D6 and you start them on Mirabegron, you could see increased levels of the, the other drug that they're on because the, the um, metabolism is being inhibited. So that's important to keep uh, an eye on, you might need to decrease the dose of the other agent. So that's it for the direct acting adrenergic agonists. Um, we also have indirect acting adrenergic agonists. 
So they are adrenergic agonists. They do stimulate the, you know, adrenergic or sympathetic response, but they don't do it by binding directly to receptors. Um, they increase the effects of endogenous or natural epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, <clears throat> amphetamine is an indirect acting adrenergic agonist. Um, the way that amphetamine works is by increasing the release of catecholamines from nerve terminals. Um, catecholamines include things like dopamine, um, which is why amphetamine is, is addictive, um, as well as norepinephrine. Um, this occurs both centrally, so we see CNS effects, and peripherally. So we see effects um, like on the heart, for example. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk more about amphetamine when we go through the central nervous system chapter, but just in general, it does result in CNS stimulation. Um, so like increased alertness, insomnia. We see a paradoxical effect in patients who have ADHD. So whereas you would think this would make them more hyper, can actually calm them down. Um, but in patients who don't have ADHD, it will increase um, that, that CNS stimulation and hyperactivity. Um, peripheral effects, we see vasoconstriction because of alpha-1 stimulation. Um, so we do see an increase in blood pressure. Um, there's increased cardiac output because of beta-1 stimulation. So we see, um, along with that, an increase in blood pressure. Um, and we'll, we will see an increase in heart rate as well. Again, we'll talk about this more um, when we do the CNS drugs. Tyramine. Um, tyramine is not a clinically useful drug, but it is important when we talk about some other drug therapy. Um, tyramine is a compound or a chemical that's found in fermented foods. So fermented foods like aged cheeses, um, Chianti wine, um, like Italian wine. Um, it's found in a lot of different aged foods, but these are just a couple examples. So tyramine, the chemical tyramine, when you have it in your body, it increases the release of catecholamines. So kind of like amphetamine does. Um, but this normally isn't a problem because tyramine is oxidized, it's metabolized by monoamine oxidase. So MAO monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that we have present. Um, and when we eat these foods that have tyramine, it just gets broken down in our body so it doesn't have any sort of measurable response. There are drugs, however, um, that are called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, these include drugs like phenylzine. Um, selegiline. So in patients who are taking monoamine oxidase inhibitors, um, for example, like for depression, um, in patients who are taking monoamine oxidase inhibitors, they don't have monoamine oxidase, so they don't have the ability to metabolize this tyramine. So in these patients, if they're eating aged cheeses and drinking Chianti wine, and they've got a bunch of tyramine building up in them, they're not able to get rid of it. So in those patients, you'll see a big sympathetic response. Um, so you can see you know, increased blood pressure, you can see vasoconstriction, so like, like vasopressor type um, episodes that can occur in patients who are taking monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, <clears throat> we don't have cocaine listed on here, but cocaine also increases the amount of norepinephrine that's in the synaptic cleft, but it does it uh, differently. It doesn't increase the release of norepinephrine. What cocaine does is it inhibits the uh, reuptake, like the, the presynaptic reuptake of norepinephrine. So that increases the amount of norepinephrine that remains in the synaptic cleft. Um, 
small increases in norepinephrine have really marked responses in the body. Um, again, we will talk about this in the CNS chapter, but just a little bit of extra norepinephrine really does have a, a large effect on the types of things that we see with cocaine or amphetamine, like increased heart rate and increased blood pressure, as well as increased CNS stimulation. Um, the last thing is a mixed acting adrenergic agonist. Um, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine are both in this cavity. Um, ephedrine is not something that you'll really see anymore. Use of ephedrine has like, declined greatly. It used to be used for um, anesthesia induced hypotension. Um, but now there are there are other agents that we'll talk about when we do cardiovascular. There are other agents that have really replaced it. Um, it used to be over the counter in like herbal supplements, but that's been banned because of all of the cardiovascular effects of it. Pseudoephedrine, on the other hand, is available um, and is you know regularly used. Um, pseudoephedrine increases the release of norepinephrine and it can directly stimulate alpha and beta receptors. So it's kind of, again, mixed acting. It's acting both directly and indirectly. Um, the actions are you know, like epinephrine, um, except that they're less potent. So we do see increases in heart rate. Um, we see increases in blood pressure. We can see some tremors. Um, we do see some CNS excitation. Um, some insomnia, so it can interfere with sleep, um, and it causes vasoconstriction. Because of that vasoconstriction, because of that vasoconstriction, um, we use it for nasal congestion and sinus congestion. Um, <clears throat> it's got excellent oral absorption, so taking it by mouth is extremely effective for um, congestion, but it does penetrate the central nervous system. So again, when we talk about adverse drug effects, this does include increased alertness and some insomnia uh, as well. Again, also stuff like increased blood pressure. Uh, we'll talk about this more when we talk about um, congestion and sinusitis, um, allergies, all of that.